So I should say welcome to you again. Hope everything is fine. And uh, I just wanted to show you the uh, the topics for for this week. And uh, uh, there's a very uh, simple topic this week, and it's called important sampling. And as far as I understood from uh, Sigve, uh, Carl, Sarah, and, uh, and Svenane, it seems that you have. Uh, gotten started with the uh, tasks uh, of exercises 1A and 1B. And uh, the thing I wanted to introduce to you now, and which will keep us busy till at least uh, the next uh, uh, time we have this session, that means within two weeks, is this topic of important sampling. So till now, what we have done is a uh, brute force uh, Monte Carlo. And that means that the, the jumping uh, in uh, coordinate space is given by a very simple algorithm where you have a random number which is multiplied with a step length. Now this step length which you choose uh, is tuned so that you roughly accept uh, something like 50% of all steps. And there is no particular mathematical foundation for that. It's more like a rule of thumb. Now what we are going to do now is to introduce uh, actually two types of equations. One is called the uh, Fokker-Planck equation, and another one is called the Langevin equation. Uh, these are equations which are used a lot in statistical physics and fluid mechanics, uh, in particular to describe uh, Brownian motion. So uh, these uh, equations, in particular the Fokker-Planck equation, uh, allows us to guide the jumping in coordinate space following the shape of the probability, which in our case is the wave function squared. So, uh, let me just quickly uh, give you a kind of uh, motivation for what we are going to do. So, if you think of uh, the plane diffusion equation, uh, if you look at this slide here, the plane diffusion equation is an equation without this f. So what we are having is a probability distribution, which now depends only on x. There's no time dependence in our probability distribution. And uh, the equation which is used to guide uh, this kind of jumping in space has now an additional term, which is uh, normally called, uh, in classical fluid mechanics, is called a drift term. So this could be some kind of external field which is uh, put on top of the system. So the first term, which you see here, is simply just the kinetic energy times a diffusion constant. So uh, what we want to do now is simply to uh, guide our random walkers in space in a slightly better way. And you know that the uh, uh, probability distribution is the ansatz for the wave function squared. Please do interrupt me if you have uh, questions, I mean, things you're wondering about. So, uh, the uh, equation here, which uh, I have, uh, I have some, slides at the, some slides at the end of today's lecture, uh, where we actually where I show how you can derive this equation, starting from uh, what's normally called the master equation. Then, uh, the way we are going to jump the new position, so this is a uh, probability, uh, is an equation for probability distribution, but then the jumping itself is then related to the solution of this called Langevin equation, which uh, was one of the uh, uh, first ways by which one were modeled Brownian motion. So there would be some kind of stochastic term here. And this stochastic term is often uh, uh, produced by using a Gaussian distribution. Now you can integrate up this equation using, for instance, Euler's method. And uh, this is some, uh, there's some theory of uh, stochastic differential equations. So when you integrate this up, you get a new position in terms of the previous one. And then this is related to a time step length delta t. So this will be a kind of variable in your calculations. There will be a time step. Obviously, if you make this step uh, very small, 
then your random walker will stay more or less at the same position. If you make it very large, you will be jumping uh, very much out of your probability distribution. I guess you tried. Uh, did I guess you did try a different step length in the brute force Monte Carlo method? And probably then you saw that if you made the step very very small, you would more or less remain at the same place. If you made the step very long or very large, then you would jump uh, out of uh, the probability distribution. So this is the. Uh, 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 the two equations which we're going to look at and which we are going to use. So what I'm going to do now is more to uh, give you the uh, uh, practical uh, equations, the way we're going to implement them, and then afterwards we are going to look at the, uh, the derivation of these equations. So um, if we look at uh, what's normally called isotropic uh, diffusion, and I know that many of you have not had fluid mechanics. I guess most of you have never had fluid mechanics. Is that right? So, uh, uh, so what I'm doing now is actually to present to you equations which you have not seen derived before. You've seen the diffusion equation. So uh, we have, uh, as before, we have a time-dependent probability density. And we know that uh, when equilibrium has been reached, that is one of the uh, criteria for using this detailed balance, then the left-hand side of this equation, dp dt, is equal to zero. So what we are saying then is that we have reached the most likely state, and we have a stationary probability distribution. So a stationary state means that the uh, it does not vary with time. So the probability distribution now with its derivative is equal to zero. Then to fulfill that equation, which is the situation we have when we are in equilibrium, means when we look at this equation, that means that the second derivative, uh, if we look at one of the components i, has to be equal to what you see here on the right hand side. So this is just simply stating that we have required this to be zero, and that means that here we have to fulfill this equation here. So that's the, uh, uh, the equation which is going to uh, lead us to uh, the next step. So if I, uh, I can model this drift vector, so in uh, normal fluid mechanics, this can be seen as some kind of external force which uh, acts on the system and makes the uh, system drift in a specific direction. When you have only kinetic energy, it doesn't drift in any specific direction. So, uh, what I do now, I assume that it has this specific shape, and uh, I so there's some kind of function, which I don't know, and then I have dp dx. So, if you go back to the previous slide, so what I'm simply saying now is that this f has some specific shape, and that shape is given by this function g of x times dp dx here. If I plug that in, I get this differential equation. So uh, the condition of stationary density means that the, uh, the left-hand side, uh, which we had in the previous equation, has to be equal to zero. So the only possibility uh, for uh, the terms containing the first and the second derivatives to cancel each other is that this function g is 1 divided with p, which is the probability distribution. If I have g equal 1 over p, then what I will get is that these terms will become equal. And if I go back here, it means that the left-hand side here will be equal to 0. Now, in our case, p is equal to the wave function squared. So since p is equal to the wave function squared, it means then that if f is equal to g of x times dp dx, I have the wave function squared. So the wave function squared gives me obviously a factor of 2. Then I take the uh, derivative of the wave function squared. And then I have uh, to divide with the wave function squared. So that leaves me with this term here. So the form of f when I'm doing quantum mechanics, 
takes this specific uh, form. And this is going to, uh, 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 this term here is actually called uh, the quantum force. That uh, has a specific name here. Uh, in fluid mechanics, this is normally called a drift force. Now, the, uh, uh, you can think of this term as something which is responsible for pushing the walker towards regions of configuration space where the trial function is large. So what we want when we run a uh, Monte Carlo calculation is obviously to jump into regions where the probability is large. The Metropolis algorithm makes sure that we also jump into regions where the probability is uh, small. That's the Metropolis algorithm, because if we were to jump into regions where the probability is at its largest, at the end we would just remain locked in the position where the probability is at its largest. So the Metropolis algorithm guarantees that we will jump also to regions where the probability is smaller. That means we fulfill the ergodic hypothesis. So the, uh, uh, this is a way to implement uh, a jumping in space which is conditioned by the force itself, or, the, or the, in our case, the uh, probability distribution. Now, if I plug this uh, drift force back into uh, uh, this equation, and some of you may have seen the solution of the uh, diffusion equation without a drift force. Uh, the solution of that one is given in terms of something which is called a Green's function. So if I plug in that specific uh, drift uh, term here, which is proportional to, or given equal to this term, I can actually solve that differential equation. And the solution of that differential equation in three, di in, uh, in three dimensions, so with d equal to, uh, uh, so the, the, this is the equation for three-dimensional uh, solution of that problem. This uh, Green's function, which now uh, tells us uh, what is the probability, the Green's function is a transition probability, and that tells us the probability of jumping from x to y within a time step delta t. So this is a uh, probability uh, uh, function, transition probability, which we then can add to the standard brute force metropolis algorithm. Because what you have done till now, when you do the uh, metropolis algorithm, is to calculate the ratio here without this uh, transition probability. So that means that uh, instead of doing the brute force uh, Monte Carlo jumping, where we only have a, a step length where we multiply the uh, position in space with, now we put in a condition here. And this condition is given by this uh, Green's function, which is a transition probability. So this is the probability for the random walker to jump from x to y within a time step delta t. So this is the way we interpret the, uh, the Green's function. It's a transition probability. So that means that we have to replace the uh, Metropolis test with uh, a Green's function here, or a transition probability, which tells us more about the way the system behaves. So that's the, uh, how to say, the, the overarching philosophy of uh, what we want to do now. So we want to move away from the uh, brute force jumping in space. And uh, uh, this quantity here is something which we now have to calculate. And that means that we also need to calculate this quantity f. So this uh, uh, quantity f is given by the first derivative of the answers for the wave function, our trial function. So that means that uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the program has now to be increased with an additional complexity, which is the, the calculation of this quantum force. Now, if you look at the Metropolis algorithm, the Metropolis algorithm uh, contains only ratios of uh, functions. So that means that uh, when you look at this quantity here, you do not compute this exponential for the denominator and the numerator. 
you would put them together, right? Because to compute an exponential is an expensive uh, operation. So since you have a ratio between two exponentials, that means that we can jump, uh, we can bring these terms together. Now the question now is, uh, how does this change our program? So let's have a look more at the uh, uh, the way the code is, is is functioning here. And here I have a. Uh, uh, so what I'm what I'm doing now? Let me just explain a little bit what I'm doing. Uh, and in the program package, there is a uh, random number generator for Gaussian deviates. So what I'm doing now is I'm plugging in this Langevin equation, which now allows me to determine the next point. And for those of you doing uh, uh, unders course, I mean physics 4460, you have probably now been playing around with the Fokker-Planck equation and Langevin's equation. Is that correct? I mean, the first project deals with a random walk in two dimension, right? Uh, the no. first project is a molecular dynamics project now. They switched them. Okay, okay. Because he had a project before where you would actually play around with these equations here. So what we need is now a function which gives us uh, random numbers which follow a uh, Gaussian distribution. And there is a function in the library which is called Gaussian deviate. So my new position now, when I go to the algorithm and I want to look at the code, so I give my old position, which is an array of the number of particles in dimensions. So this is called Gaussian deviate. And then we have to fix a time step. So the result will depend on this variable uh, time step. And you will typically have to play around with different time steps from, let's say, 0 0.1 down to 10 to the minus 4. And you will typically see that if the time step is made very small, then you will remain locked in uh, more or less the same position because you move little in space. And what you will see then is that you will need many more Monte Carlo samples to sample uh, the whole distribution. So what I'm doing now is I calculate uh, in, in the next line here, I calculate the old wave function. So I have the old position and then I have some variational parameters. So you don't need to look into the details here, but just look at the philosophy. And then I compute this uh, quantum force in the old position. And I return something which I call for quantum force old. And uh, that one uh, is needed because I'm going to compute this ratio. So I need the probability for jumping from x to y and y to x. That means that I will need uh, the proper, this quantity which you see up here in the old position and the new position. Then I have a loop now over the uh, Monte Carlo cycles, as you see on the top here. I run over the number of particles and the dimensions. And then I compute now the new position. So I compute the position for all the particles and x, y, and z. In our cases, we are doing three-dimensional system. So that's the old position times this Gaussian uh, number times this, the, uh, the, the, square of the, the square of the time step plus the quantum force. And then there's a diffusion constant, which is actually equal to one half when we do quantum mechanics. So that means that what I'm doing now is I'm adding uh, the quantum force here. The diffusion constant is just equal to one half because I've made, I've scaled my Schrodinger equation in dimensionless units. So D is equal to one half from the kinetic energy. So D is one half here. And then I have to multiply with this delta T. Then, um, so I have now the new positions. And then uh, I run, uh, I move one particle at a time. So uh, I have to put, uh, uh, I'm putting now the, uh, if, if the particle which I'm not moving, I keep that, the particle which I'm moving, I'm putting that equal to the new position. 
just uh, just a moment, please. I have to lock the door of my office because there's an intercom. You, you probably you, you hear some voices from outside, right? Let me just lock, lock my office door. Yeah, there's a there's an intercom. There's an internal intercom system here. So now I move uh, one particle at a time, and I compute at the end here the new wave function, and then I compute this uh, quantum force again, because I need now to compute the uh, probability ratio. So I need uh, the quantum force in the new position. So I would have an f of y. I have an f of x here. I'm moving from x to y. Then I compute it in the previous position, and then I have to do it from jumping from uh, y to x, so I would also need it in a new position here. Then, when I have this quantum force, what I'm doing here now is to do the metropolis test. So, I'm now going to compute the log of the ratio of the Green's functions. And the reason why I do that is because I, I don't want to compute the exponential first, because I could uh, risk uh, uh, that I could actually get the uh, uh, some some uh, numbers which would uh, be exceedingly large, and I could have some loss in numerical precision. So what I do now is I take the log of the ratio of the two Green's functions, and this is this operation which you see here. So I simply look at the the ratios of uh, the factor which you see here, this factor here. So I take this function here, and I take what I have in the uh, exponentials, I take the log of that, then when I've computed the log, I go back and then I take the exponential. So now I'm just computing the the uh, input to the exponential. And this is just setting, putting together all these equations. That gives me the uh, Green's functions, the ratios of the Green's functions. Then my uh, metropolis test uh, says now that I have uh, this uh, Green's function ratio. I have the new wave function squared divided with the old wave function squared. And that is uh, my test, which I have to do here. So this is what enters now the Metropolis algorithm. And then the Metropolis algorithm is typically called now for the Metropolis Hastings, because I have a conditional jumping in space added to it. Then I... Uh, put the old position equal to the new position, and then I do the same with the quantum force, and then I put the new, the old wave functions equal to the new wave function. So this is just the standard metropolis algorithm as you have been implementing it before. Now, if I look at the uh, this uh, quantum force, now what, what I've done here is actually to compute uh, the quantum force uh, numerically. And uh, I don't know, have you implemented the uh, the uh, closed form expression for the uh, local energy? Have you been able to do it? Not yet. So you, you have been doing it numerically, right? So that means that uh, if we if we go back a little bit that for, for the helium atom, it means that you uh, when you look at the wave function, you uh, have not yet implemented uh, this form here, right, for the local energy. You just computed numerically. Now, if you include the uh, uh, closed form expression for the local energy, which uh, with this wave function, actually it takes this form here, uh, that actually speeds up your code almost with a factor of three. So it's a considerable speed up because you don't need to deal with numerical derivatives. So, uh, what I plugged in here is actually the uh, numerical derivative, and uh, what I need to do then, so I use this uh, three-point formula for the first derivative, and you see that I move uh, one step uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the left and one step to the right, I loop over all the particles and the dimensions here, and then I compute the wave function when I move one step h to the left, and when I move one step to the right, 
And that means that the quantum force is now equal to this numerical expression for the uh, uh, first derivative, so the wave function to the right minus the wave function to the left, defined by the step length h. And uh, uh, I have a factor uh, divided by 2 times the, the size of the step length. I think there is a... Uh, yeah, and then there's a factor of 2, because we have uh, the... Uh, factor of 2 in front of the quantum force, which is this factor here. And then uh, I wrote this out in a little bit stupid way. And the reason for why I did that is I want to show you the factor of 2 here. And then obviously I divide it by 2 because the wave function to the one step to the right minus one step to the left divided by 2 times h, that is the mathematical formula for the first derivative when I use three points. So this is what we call the uh, uh, three point centered uh, first derivative. Numerically, you would actually take away these values of 2, right? So this is, uh, looks a little bit stupid, but in the slides here I put it in because I wanted to stress the fact that the mathematical formula has 2 times h. And then I need to multiply with 2. But when you write the program, these are additional operations which make you waste a lot of CPU time. So you would have to take this away. But here I just put it because I wanted to plug in the mathematics as it stands. And then uh, when I've taken the derivative for, let's say, the x direction, then I have to put the, uh, the values of uh, r for x back to the uh, old values. And then I move to the y direction, and then I take the derivative in the y direction, and then I continue till I, I take the derivative in the z direction. And this is the same way as you have been implementing this till now. Now, what I wanted to do now is to uh, show you how you can calculate the closed form expression. So instead of doing these uh, uh, numerical operations here, you should rather think of implementing the closed form of the, f of the first derivative. And uh, if we look at the, uh, uh, the quantum force, and we have this, uh, uh, one of the terms which uh, uh, causes complications for us is the Jastrow factor. So let me go back a little bit to that, and uh, let me tell you what this Jastrow factor is. So the Jastrow factor is this factor here, which deals with the correlations in the wave function. And I'm going to call this Psi of C, C for correlation. So uh, to calculate the first derivative of this uh, object here is quite simple. That is rather straightforward. Now, this Jastrow factor has a more, slightly more complicated shape. So if we move back to these uh, equations, Then, uh, when I'm looking at the, uh, the derivative with respect to uh, uh, particle k, which is indicated here, now I'm summing over, so this uh, function g, if you look at what we have, this is what we have. So this function g is now given by what you see in here. So in our case, uh, to compute the first derivative <coughs> of the, our quantity, I mean this quantity which you see here, <coughs> ends in this equation here. And this is one of the things I, I would like you to uh, derive yourself and convince yourself that this equation here is, uh, is the correct equation. So we are moving, remember now that we are moving one particle at a time. So I'm looking at the derivative of particle k here. So this is uh, fairly easy to code, and instead of uh, doing all these numerical operations, we can now simply code this equation which you see here. Now, what you see now is that this is the distance between particle k, the relative distance between particle k and j. This is the absolute value. This is obviously a vector. So that means that we have to tabulate this for x, y, and z. 
So when you look at this one, uh, you see uh, the root of a possible complication. Because we are moving, at the end, we are going to move many particles. For the two-particle system, this is very easy, right? So for the helium atom we are looking at now, this is simply particle one and particle two. And then we don't need to uh, care so much about tabulating all these values for uh, the relative distance. However, when you now come to many particles, then this spans a big matrix. And then we have to think a little bit on how we want to encode that matrix. So the thing I would like you to do now is to, uh, when you're uh, in this week and the next week, uh, is to uh, try to implement the closed form expression for the local energy and this uh, quantum force. And then compare these closed form expressions to those which you have uh, uh, you obtain when you do the numerical derivatives. And then the nice thing is actually to look at the, uh, the, uh, the time expenditure. And obviously you have to convince yourself, so you have to do the uh, derivatives here. And then uh, uh, we can start thinking of uh, when you write the program, think of writing the program so you can actually look at more than two particles so that the program is general, so you don't specify your program to just two electrons. Because we will, in two weeks, we will start looking at uh, beryllium, and beryllium has four electrons. And uh, you could think of start implementing important sampling, try to finish part 1a and 1b. We have a program for the uh, random numbers uh, with a Gaussian distribution. And if you want to read more, you've probably seen this textbook by uh, this Dutch guy here. And there's, a, there's many more details. That textbook has also some details about uh, uh, molecular dynamics as well, which is useful for those of you taking uh, physics 4460. So when you do these things, uh, there are some small hints. So uh, you've been using Git now, right? So Git allows you to have some version control. So another alternative is just to make a copy of your code and say, okay, this is the code which now runs everything uh, in a, with numerical derivatives. Then uh, the thing you could do now is just to make a copy of it and implement the closed form expression on the local energy. There is in uh, uh, a profiling program which, in, uh, which follows the standard uh, uh, Linux distributions and that's called gprof. So what you do then is that you compile your program with the option minus pg. Then uh, you can run both codes. Obviously you make sure that you get the, the same answers for the energy. Then when you run the program, after you have run the program, you can actually write the gprof on the command line and the name of your executable and you can route out your uh, output to a file which is called out profile. Now that uh, file will tell you which functions are using most of the time. And there you can also see a detailed uh, uh, information on uh, how much every function is using. So gprof is a very useful tool as a first shot at profiling your program. And it gives you uh, relevant information on the uh, on the time usage of every function. So when you uh, uh, implement the uh, closed form expressions, you should actually try to benchmark the program against your former version of the code. And uh, the, the kind of wave functions which we are going to use, the wave functions will contain a correlated part, or this uh, Jastrow factor, which looks like this. So this is a kind of form which we will uh, uh, use throughout the rest of this project. So uh, the thing I wanted to say a little bit more now is to is about how you can uh, uh, program this in a slightly more efficient way. So when we are doing the uh, 
Metropolis uh, Hastings ratio, uh, we need to compute, uh, later we are going to compute actually s Slater determinants. In your case, the single particle piece is very simple. I mean, what you're doing now for the single particle part of the wave function is simply the piece which you see here. But when we come to beryllium or more complicated systems, this is going to be replaced by a determinant. And that will complicate life. So that's our next complication after important sampling. So if we move a little bit on here, uh, we will need to compute these ratios between Slater determinants, and then we need to compute ratios between this correlated wave function. In addition, we need uh, to optimize the calculation of the quantum force, and we need to optimize the calculation of the kinetic energy. So the quantum force requires this quantity, and the kinetic energy requires this quantity. So these are uh, uh, quantities which we need to have an optimal code for. And this is some of the things uh, uh, which actually uh, you can save a lot of CPU time by thinking carefully on how to optimize these parts. So if we look at the wave function, so the wave function itself, suppose we take this ratio here, the wave function itself is a single particle piece which will be a determinant times this correlation part. So this is the ratio which we're going to compute. And then when we write out the derivatives, you see that the first derivative will now contain a part with a, a single particle piece, which is the determinant, times the correlation part. And then the derivative of the correlation part times this one, divided by the uh, wave function here. And that is equal to this quantity. So these are two ratios which we need to compute. First derivative and divided with the determinant and first derivative here divided with the correlation piece. So we need to optimize the calculation of these quantities because these are ratios, these ratios here and these ratios here are quantities which we will calculate many, many times. And then when we calculate the kinetic energy of the particle I, we need to compute this piece. And we need to optimize that in the best possible way. So we can actually show that this becomes equal to this quantity here. And that means that we end up computing this quantity. This is the quantity which enters the calculation of the local energy. And that means that we need to take care of all these ratios which you see here. So at the end, when we want to compute the energy, we have to deal with the, the second derivative of the single particle piece, which for helium, the helium atom is quite simple. Then we need uh, this part here. So we need the second derivative of that uh, Jastrow factor. So we need not only the first derivative of this quantity here, but also the second derivative. And now you see that uh, the calculation of uh, this quantity is something which we have done when we compute the local energy, now the, the, the quantum force. So we have already set up a program here. And note that these are now vectors. So these have an x, y, and z dependence. So these are uh, complications which we now need to think of. When we do this numerically, life is extremely simple. Okay. Because numerically, that's what you have done till now, right? So when you do this, uh, the derivatives numerically, you simply calculate uh, the wave function at uh, plus h, minus h, and then you compute either the first derivative or you compute the second derivative. So numerically, uh, the expressions which you see here, these expressions here, are simple to evaluate. However, uh, if we want to plug in the closed form expressions, which will give us an additional gain in computational time, then we need to pay attention to uh, the computation of these quantities. Now, uh, uh, one of the things we also need to think of when we are uh, making the calculations 
is the uh, uh, the way we store this information because we will be moving one particle at a time. That means that many of these quantities here remain the same. So in, this, in our three-dimensional case, this relative distance is simply given by this expression. And uh, in, so this is the function in our particular case. So I will just rewritten it. So we have this uh, general expression of G which can be split up in a part uh, from i equal 1 and then from j equal i2 plus 1. So this, in our case, it's uh, an exponential and it has this explicit form here. And this beta is one of the variational parameters. So one of the things uh, you can think of is actually uh, uh, when you come to more particles, is actually to store uh, the relative positions as a matrix. And since this is symmetric, you only need to store these numbers here. So it's actually a, a strictly an upper triangular matrix when, you, when we store it. So this is one of the things uh, you should keep in mind in the discussions to come here. So you need to, uh, to uh, think on how you want to store the data. Because at the end, we are going to do more than four electrons also. With two to four electrons, uh, these calculations here, they don't require very much storage. But when you're doing 10 electrons, obviously this becomes a fairly large quantity. And we need to be a little bit careful with the, the way we deal with the data. So this is something to think of. Now, what comes here is a lot of manipulations. So I will not uh, uh, bother you with, uh, you, ca you can look through the slides and you can just go through the mathematics. Uh, I'm not going to go through that in the slides here, but you can look it up uh, later and just look at the derivation. So the thing I want to uh, uh, come to at the end here is the uh, calculation of uh, the, the, so I, I've gone through all this algebra and you, we're not going to discuss it here, but the, the, the quantity which is interesting for us is the, in particular, the derivative of the Jastro factor, the second derivative. And with this specific function, if we call this function for f, so that's the content of the exponential here, then we can show that uh, for particle k, this is now given by this formula which you see here. And this is one of the things I want you to check and convince yourself that the mathematics is done correctly. And then when you plug in the explicit shape of f, so this is the derivative of f with respect to rij. If I plug in the derivatives correctly, then this is the final expression for the uh, second derivative of the correlation part of the wave function. So in one, of the, in one of the tasks for this week and next week, one of the tasks is actually to convince yourself that uh, this expression is correct. And then uh, you can go through the algebra, which I have put up on the slides here. So the uh, single particle part of the wave function is actually very simple. This is the one which causes complications. And you see that these are vectors. So you have to pay attention to that. So you, have, you will need the x component, the y, and the z components. Whereas uh, these other quantities, they are just the absolute value of rki, rkj, and so forth. Now, there's something else here which I haven't derived yet, but uh, which I will derive on the, uh, on the blackboard for you when we uh, meet in the beginning of March. So uh, the correlation part, uh, we have to pay a little bit attention if the electrons have equal spins or opposite spins. So I will give you a proper derivation of these quantities when we meet, because it's much easier to show this on the, on the blackboard than just doing on slides here. Uh, I, can put, uh, I will put some derivations on the slides as well, so you can actually uh, look it up yourself. But uh, this factor of A, this is not a variational parameter, 
this factor of A takes two different values, and that follows from this electron-electron cusp condition. We will discuss that a little bit more in detail later. So the variational parameter is beta. When you did the helium atom, you simply put A equal to a half here. If the particles have the same spin, we have to be a little bit more careful, and then we have to put a factor of 1 divided by 4. And that will give you the derivation later, as I said. Now, uh, what I would like to propose today, since this important sampling is uh, not, uh, how to say, it's uh, what to do numerically is, should be fairly clear. Uh, what I've put on the slides here is a lot of material on the derivation of the Fokker-Planck equation. So what I would like to propose now is that uh, instead of uh, uh, me going through the derivation of the Fokker-Planck equation is that you just read it yourself and just look at this as background material. Is that okay? Because sometimes it's a little bit boring for me just to uh, read from these slides without having the possibility to use a blackboard and to extend the arguments on that one. So there's a, this kind of format which we have now is a little bit limited when it comes to some more detailed information which I need to give you. So if I move back to the, uh, to the tasks which I uh, set up here, so uh, I would like you now to uh, start studying the closed form expressions uh, of both the local energy and the uh, so-called quantum force. They do the paper and pencil work. I mean, you have to sit down and simply just do it and convince yourself that uh, the expressions are correct. Then I would propose that uh, you implement important sampling first using numerical derivation. And then you have a program which runs. Then when you have uh, uh, convinced yourself that the important sampling is functioning, then you go back and you implement the uh, local energy expressions and the expression for the quantum force. So that means you need to compute first derivatives and second derivatives in a closed form. I have put enough uh, mathematics so you can actually rederive the equations, but you need to structure that information when you write your program. So uh, my, 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 my uh, recommendation now is that you, uh, you compute uh, the uh, important sampling part using numerical derivatives first. So you implement this quantum force, and that is not so difficult. Then, uh, and that will take you, uh, I, I would guess that within two weeks we should have that. At the same time, look at the closed form expressions and start thinking on how to implement the closed form expressions and you will see a considerable speed up in your code, guaranteed. <coughs> so what most people do when they run these multi power calculations is that if <coughs> the wave function itself, if it has some shape like this, then you do implement this one in a closed form. Obviously, if the shape is too complicated, then uh, you know that it is very easy to make an error when you compute the uh, derivatives by hand. And it's also very easy to make an error when you want to program a long expression. So when you have uh, much more complicated expressions here for the correlation part, what people would end up doing then is just to compute things numerically. However, uh, the, uh, the standard uh, correlation part which are used in, in the literature normally have take this form here, or some kind of complications of that form. But still, it would be some kind of exponential which runs like uh, what you see here. But there could be the higher powers of R. So you could have a variational parameter delta here which runs with R squared, and so on. But that gives you just uh, more flexibility with uh, uh, a larger set of variational parameters. So the more variational parameters uh, leads often to a uh, a better estimate of uh, the ground state energy. 
So I would like actually today I would like to stop here and uh, I would like to ask you to read some of the material on, on the Fokker-Planck equation and then we will come back to uh, more detailed derivations of some of these missing quantities when we meet uh, in the beginning of March, if that sounds okay. So I would propose that we, we stop here today and then that you go back and try to continue implement uh, uh, the local energies and start thinking of doing the uh, important sampling at the lab. Does that sound okay? Are the tasks, I mean, how many of you have uh, been able to have a Monte Carlo program which runs for the helium atom now? Okay, so we are still lagging a little bit behind there. Yeah? The, the reason I ask is that uh, it's it's important to uh, that we we have a a program which uh, is more or less uh, at a certain stage towards the end of March when we get close to Easter. And uh, don't procrastinate the uh, development of the code. Huh? Any questions? Yep. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, is, uh that we need to draw uh, normally distributed random numbers. And yeah. I'm wondering if you have tried using the random normal function in Armadillo and if you think that's good enough for our purposes. Absolutely, absolutely. So because in, in Armadillo you have a Gaussian uh, uh, random numbers uh, generator. And that is based on this uh, Box-Muller algorithm which is the same as uh, the one which I provide. So that should be fine enough, actually, the one you have in Amadillo. But you could test them against each other. Yeah, over. Yeah. Why do we move only one uh, electron at a time? Oh, we, we move one at a time. I mean, you could, you could think of moving all of them and then testing uh, the, uh, taking the ratios, right? Now, one of the reasons why we move one at a time uh, is uh, is a technical one. Uh, when we are going to calculate the wave function for uh, uh, I mean the single particle piece, if you look at it here, is uh, given this is the single particle piece, but when you come to many particles you have a determinant. And you can actually uh, set up, uh, when you move uh, one particle at a time, a very efficient algorithm to compute the determinant. So because if you if you think of the determinant, a determinant if you have n particles, this is an uh, n cubed operations. And then you're moving n particles, so that is n to the power of 4. If you were to move all particles. So that is a costly operation. What you can actually do is to, uh, with a smart rewrite, of the calculation of the determinant. <laughs> 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 Jag tror att det är det. 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 Jag tror att det är det.
Ja, du ser at du skal komme og lyde under der, dersom han ja. faktisk kritiserer dig. Så det ser som mikrofonen til Martin ikke er det den skal. Å nei. Martin? Mytene. Vi hører ingenting med. Har du mutet mikrofonen din? Ja, det er ikke sånn. Man kan bruke en mellomsgreie oppe der til å skrive i stedet. Hvis du hører oss, så bruk chatten. Så ser du bare litt for... Det kan vi bruke på. Det er slide 61, så det er hva vi sier. Ja. Hva har noe skjedd med marken din? Ja, men... Med... Gå her. Er den her nok? Det er litt morsomt hvis han snakket med seg selv i sånn to... Det kan jeg kanskje ta en ny ut, da. Ja, jeg synes at du er sånn. Hva tar du? Mange deltanger. Hæ? Ok, nå kom det opp. Hører du meg nå? Kan du høre meg nå? Ja. Ok, nå hører du meg, hva? Nei, det kom opp en melding her. Jeg så ikke den før nå, at det står Due to the number of participants in this hangout, your microphone is muted by default. Ok, I didn't see that message in the window here. Okay, let me, let me, uh, and we had some connectivity problems actually, just some few minutes ago. Now, the, the question was, uh, why do we, uh, uh, why do we uh, move one electron at a time? And uh, one of the main reasons for doing that is that moving one electron at a time, when we compute a, a determinant for the single particle part, gives a much more efficient algorithm. If we move uh, all electrons, that scales like a uh, number of electrons to the power of four floating point operations. When we uh, 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 replace that one with an efficient algorithm for computing uh, the determinant, then moving one electron at a time reduces this to uh, a scaling which runs like uh, n to the power of two operations. So there is a considerable numerical gain in moving one electron at a time. So that's one of the main reasons. There's a technical, there's a main technical reason. But you could think of actually moving all the particles and then performing the metropolis test. That gives, tends often to give a uh, slightly more inefficient algorithm. Instead of uh, testing every single move. We will see that in two weeks when we are going to look at the uh, calculation of the uh, determinant for beryllium. More questions? Yeah. Um, so far I've been parallelizing my code in open and and I also yeah. make sure you need to do the whole NPI machinery for the project. Or can I well, yeah, no, OpenMP is okay if you stay with, uh, within one node and you can use a certain number of cores. But if you need to run on uh, more than just one node, then uh, OpenMP is uh, not that optimal for parallelizing the code. So then you would need a kind of mix between OpenMP and MPI. Yeah, so um, I guess my question is, are we going to use more than one node at any point then? We are going to run on uh, on Titan, the, the 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 local machine here, right? So that means that uh, you are going to run with just with more than one node. Right? So we, uh, you are going to get access to the new facility here, right? Which, or oh, actually, it's the old facility which we carried down from USIT uh, last year, and we are going to run calculations on that machine. More questions?
okay. Then we meet again like this in uh, in two weeks, and then we are going to discuss also uh, the calculation of determinants. And that is a part which 